What's up guys, it's Michael Morgan here from Lathrop High School and morganapteaching.com. I've got here another AP review video for you, but if you want to join over 90% of my students in passing the AP test, then check out the links below. I've got writing guides, review guides, instruction guides, and everything I know on how to help you pass the AP test. So feel free to check out my website, and if you find this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. So period four then, this one is about the formation of the second party system, and then of course the sectional divide um, of the United States going forward. Um, and so yes, let's go ahead and cover start turn period two. So, or period four. So one of the events that really starts this is the election of Thomas Jefferson in 1800. So 1800, we have the election of Thomas Jefferson, and as the first non-federalist Democratic Republican, and he has completely opposite views of the Federalist Party. Now, this was a moment of, I guess you could say, well, it was a monumental defining moment in American history because this was the first chance an opposing party member had an opportunity to go after the previous party. Like, he could have gone and tried to undo everything the Federalists had done, or attack the Federalists, or whatever, and he kind of had reason to do it because Adams tried to essentially spite him at the end with his midnight assignments, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but Jefferson sort of took the high road. It's not that he wasn't going to push his party's agenda, but he wasn't going to try to make it, you know, a more vengeful presidency. He was going to try to implement the policies he felt were the best for the country, but he wasn't going to try to go and attack the previously empowered Federalists. So fortunately, this set a good precedent for the um, rest of the presidents going forward. All right, so as a Democratic Republican, he was a big believer in uh, independent farmers. He did not want a national bank. A national bank serves a base for the function of what the Federal Reserve does now. They print and control our currency. They give out and pro profit off of loans, securities, bonds, investments, etc. Um, and we had one established. It was the idea of Hamilton. And Jefferson really didn't like it, but he saw no other alternative um, other than letting that bank continue. Because he didn't want to cause an economic collapse or anything like that. So despite the fact he didn't like it, the fact that he's anti-bank, he does actually uh, help keep it going, or at least not stop it. They're anti-bank, anti-commerce. But this independent farmer thing is going to really define a lot of his policies. So he, he doesn't believe in high taxes. He wants lowest taxes possible. He wants very little federal control. So what he's going to do is he's try to cut spending. So it's reduced taxes. It's kind of like the like Reagan austerity measures. He's going to try to cut taxes by cutting and cut federal spending. Now, there's not a whole lot of federal spending at the time. But the thing he's going to cut, or try to cut with his Democratic-Republican Congress, is they're going to cut uh, taxes by cutting programs like uh, infrastructure programs. And this is going to really bite the United States in the butt. Like, they're not going to have any roads, or at least not many roads, or uh, canals, or even later railroads, when they're going to need them in the War of 1812. Uh, cut taxes, so it means it's going to cut infrastructure and military. So he substantially reduces the size of the military and navy built up by uh, Washington and Adams. So he's sort of, I guess, planning on never getting into a real fight with anybody else. And he assumes that, like the Revolutionary War, if it does happen again, Everyone will rise up, unite, and American resiliency will be victorious again. He's going to be wrong, by the way, in the War of 1812, which we'll, which we'll find out later. Regardless, um, that's going to be his approach, cutting taxes to promote uh, the expansion of agriculture. Now, here, here's a problem with his view. He thought, so we're taking the American territory, so it's kind of split into two areas initially, right? Because they haven't quite settled this... Uh, side, the western side of the Appalachian Mountain. They've started to, but it's not completely settled. So, this eastern portion, though, that's been settled for, I mean, almost two centuries at this point. So, any individual farmer that got a bunch of land, that land gets smaller with any generation. You know why it gets smaller every generation? So, like, I have kids, here's my property, I die. What happens to that property? It gets distributed. It gets divided amongst my family, right? And they had a lot of kids back then. Right? So what's going to happen as time goes on to that amount of land? Smaller. It becomes less. Smaller and, less. and smaller and smaller. Right. 
So at some point, pretty quickly, the newer generations are going to have to go somewhere else because there's not going to be enough land to survive off of. So part of Jefferson's policy is going to be, we need to make it really cheap and easy for people to go start their own farms, essentially. All right, it's not a very good long-term plan. Uh, it works while you have a bunch of cheap land available, and they kind of do, right? So that's why he really promotes people settling uh, to the West. But he's going to need to expand the size of the United States quite a bit. And so that's going to spark sort of this call that goes throughout uh, the 19th century, long after Jackson, or sorry, Jefferson and the you know, Democratic Republicans are gone. It's going to start that desire uh, to expand uh, American territory all the way to the West Coast. That's Manifest Destiny. We'll talk more about that a little later. But it does start here with Jefferson. Because again, he needs there to be a lot of open, cheap land so families can keep moving West and settling that uh, farming territory, right? It'd be a much better idea to set up investment, business, and, and factories because you can sort of stay in one location in a city and do that and not take up much space. But according to Jefferson's formula, you're going to need a lot of territory. So he encourages people to settle west, and he's really eager to add more and more territory so they can keep doing that. Uh, so while it is an initiative by Jefferson, it's going to continue even after he's gone because it sort of sets this mindset that America needs to expand and settle from coast to coast. So his first example is when he unconstitutionally, but it was such a good deal that Congress was okay with it, uh, purchased Louisiana. So he purchased a huge chunk from France. France in 1803 conquers Spain, or at least has them secede their territory in Louisiana to France. And France just goes and sells it to the United States immediately. So Jefferson buys it and he doesn't really constitutionally have the power to do that. But it was so cheap, it was only $15 million for all this territory. That's less than three cents an acre. Congress is like, well, you shouldn't do this, but it's such a good deal, we're just going to approve it. Um, so you have the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. And that doubles the, the size of the United States, roughly speaking. And we're also going to extend territory uh, three more major times uh, here in the I guess you'd say, first half of the 19th century. The next one is going to be, uh, this is when Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans are pretty much gone. Jefferson's alive, but he's not active in public life. And at this point, the Democratic public, Republican Party is splitting in the process of splitting. But again, the precedent for expansion has already been set by this agrarian sort of individual farmer view set by Jefferson. The next one we're going to have is um, the, um, I forgot to look at the name of the treaty. Whatever it is, in 1819, we actually get the territory of Spanish Florida that becomes added to us. Is it Adams Onus Treaty? Yeah. 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 There you go. <clears throat> Spanish Florida, 1819. We also are going to dispute and split peacefully this territory of Oregon. Obviously, it's more in Oregon. It's like Idaho and. Oregon and Washington now, but the Oregon Territory here in 1846 is peacefully split with, um, what's it called? Britain? <coughs> All right, and that is 1846. I should also mention too that um, Jefferson commissions Lewis and Clark and others to sort of explore this territory and try to find a route um, to the Pacific Ocean. And they do eventually find the Pacific Ocean, but it's not that relevant to this class. Um, Spanish Florida, what year was that again? 1819, I believe. That's what I got up there. And lastly, this one we'll talk about a little bit more in depth, because these are all pretty simple. Purchased, this was part of a dispute settlement, especially since Spain was on the verge of losing most of their Latin American colonies. And then uh, the Oregon Territory was a, was a large tract of land that was like up in the air. And the British and um, Americans just sort of uh, drew the line, continuing with the, uh, oh, what parallel was that? Is the 49th parallel? Whatever parallel that is, um, to um, split, to keep the British territories and the American territories sort of like nicely split between the two. And that was, again, basically Idaho, parts of Montana, Washington, and Oregon for us, what they are now. And then the one that we'll talk about for a little bit here is we add uh, Texas and uh, we win a lot of territory in the southwest, pretty much this territory here. 
1848. It started in 1846, but this is known as the Mexican-American War. Now again, at this point, Jefferson, you know, and the Democratic Republicans are either out or on the way out. But the precedent was set by Jefferson because they needed to keep expanding to provide farmland uh, to just continue all the way uh, to the West Coast. And they're gonna, that's sort of known as Manifest Destiny. And they're going to carry that Americanization of the native inhabitants going forward to either clear them or incorporate them and assimilate them into American society. And that's a theme that runs throughout the 19th century. So Mexican-American War. Uh, just a quick, I guess, explanation of it. This territory was given to Mexico as they broke away, I believe it was 1820. They officially uh, fought for independence and won independence from Spain as a part of the beginnings of the Latin American revolutions. So they do that. Mexico becomes a massive country of millions of people, and including California, right? But the borders are somewhat unclear. And also, most of this territory is un unsettled. Like Texas, Oklahoma, the Rockies regions, California does have the missions and forts, but Arizona, Nevada, not a whole lot of settlement there. It's pretty much wide open. So the Spanish and later Mexican government were totally cool with uh, Spanish and Mexican settlers coming in, but they were also cool with American settlers coming in. Uh, obviously, they weren't considered American anymore, but they just wanted anyone to settle and use that territory. And then, of course, taxes and profits and other benefits to go to the Mexican government, they were cool with it. However, by the mid-1840s, the American settlers and Spanish settlers of the region of now, what is now called Texas, actually broke away and fought for independence from Mexico, despite the fact they were such a young nation. Uh, they called themselves, they were their own country for a time, uh, they're called the Republic of Tejas, um, and that is again a mix of Hispanic and white European um, settlers that break away from Mexico. And in 1845, they're going to voluntarily be annexed by the United States, which of course upsets Mexico. They kind of think it was like an American plot to do this. But again, there's no agreement on the border. So Mexico says the borders on the, I think it's called the Nueces River, and the United States says the borders on the Rio Grande River. And of course, there is a border dispute and both countries put their troops in what is they consider their own territory. So when the Mexican and the United States troops see each other, I believe the Mexicans fired first. Regardless, they fired on each other, and that sort of sparked the um, Mexican-American War, which is really just a good excuse for the, and I realize we need to get a little ahead of ourselves, but by 1846 and 48, the United States had begun industrializing. They had railroads, they had manufactured goods, they were commercialized. They had a much better military uh, and economy and more organized political system. So this war was not much of a war. It was uh, a fairly easy American victory. And as sort of the spoils of that war, they forced the Mexican government to sign the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo to sort of complete their settlement or at least ownership of the territory from the east to west coast. So now it spanned completely from the Atlantic to the Pacific as they gained the territories that are what now, what are now California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, uh, what else? Utah, Wyoming, like parts, parts of a lot of states, Colorado, etc. So that's kind of our expansion westward. All right. And again, sparked by Jefferson's desire to expand farmland, because again, families can't sit on the same farms for generations, otherwise you run out of enough territory. So they had to keep expanding, keep going. All right, very short-sighted, but it, it works while you still have the land, I suppose. All right, uh, another policy I forgot to mention, and again, this is, this is not on, this is not Jefferson's doing, this is more of the split party. Uh, this party's gonna more or less, other people in it as well, are gonna split between uh, national Republicans and Democrats, and the Democrats are going to be a lot more aggressive on expanding and settling in regard re regarding the uh, Native Americans. So you're going to have guys like General um, Andrew Jackson when he becomes president. His attitude towards the Native Americans are they are an obstacle. We need to remove them. So he does. And so, like in for example, when the Democrats are in power in 1830, 
you have the Indian Removal Act. which of course force any Native Americans residing here, like the Cherokee, Creek, Chickasaw, others that were previously hostile, they are forced to migrate to the uh, territory of Oklahoma as an Indian reservation. And by the way, that is not even remotely the same environment as the Southern Appalachian. So they're used to like wetlands and mountains and things like that, and now they're moved to Oklahoma, which is open plains, totally different environment. So that's gonna be difficult. And in fact, the force movement, a lot of those uh, earlier, like the Cherokee, for example, uh, those are, that instance, when they force march a bunch of Cherokee, and a lot of die, old, sick, young, etc., on that march westward, it's called it the Trail of Tears. Um, so the, I guess, American settlement of this territory, uh, of course, had a um, very negative impact on the Native American population in the uh, southeastern portion of the United States. So again, Cherokee Creek, Chickasaw, others forcibly moved into the Midwest, and again, a lot of Cherokee themselves died on that on that journey, also known as the uh, Trail of Tears. Most of the uh, able-bodied adults made it, but again, if you're old or sick or very young, walking long distances like that is is tiresome, cause you to uh, become undernourished or suffer from heat stroke, whatever, and possibly die. Okay. Are we good on understanding the beginnings of Manifest Destiny and the expansion of American territory? Yes. And we understand how Jefferson was, and his ideas were partly responsible for that? Yes. All right, cool. Understand too. We'll talk more about it later when we get to the Democrats and Jackson, but uh, their hard sta harsh stance towards Native Americans as an obstacle. Okay, let's talk more now about um, how the economy sort of changed under Jefferson. So. A couple things. Jefferson, of course, encourages independent agriculture, but there's going to be a renewal of conflict between Great Britain and France in the um, early 1800s. So for a while, we have that Jay Treaty, which keeps us pretty peacefully uh, engaged with the British as far as com commerce goes. However, there's going to be a change of sentiments going into the 1800s. But, so what's going to happen is, if you remember from World or Euro, Napoleon comes to power in the early 1800s, declares himself emperor, all that stuff. Renews conflicts with a lot of Europe, takes over a lot of Europe, right? Like takes over Spain, takes the Louisiana territory. So we have a renewal of war with uh, Napoleonic France and the British government, the British Empire again. So by, by 1803, we have war between Napoleonic France and most of Europe again. Different states jump in at different times, but just understand France is back at war with everybody else. All right. So they have high taxes, they have militaries, navies, etc. We don't. Ours have really fallen into uh, disrepair or have been decommissioned. So we have very little in terms of defense as far as the Navy goes or the Army goes. So if the warring states of Britain or France decide to start targeting us for supplies or men or whatever, we don't really have any ability to stop them. And we're going to find that out the hard way. And again, a lot of that's because of Jackson, or sorry, Jefferson and his uh, anti-taxes uh, and infrastructure uh, projects. That's really going to come to hurt us later. So here's how it sort of happens. The British had this rule that they carried on everybody else. It's called the Rule of 18, was it, sorry, 17, um, I forget the year, was it 53? I forgot to write it down. The year might be wrong on this, but it's called the Rule of 18, 1763 or 1753. Rule of 17, I'm gonna say it's 53. This is the British rule. All right, I might have the year wrong, but the, but the, uh, the concepts can be the same. The British rule was, if you stop trade with a nation during peacetime, you cannot renew trade during wartime, because it's clearly an indicator that you're trying to make more money to support a war effort, right? And that's part of the mercantilist system. They don't want to trade with the people very much. So if they've got like a big sugar trade or something like that, they're not trying to trade with or provide that sugar to other countries, right? They want it to stay and the profits to stay in their own country. So the French 
had halted their sugar trade with the United States during peacetime. All right, but Napoleon is going to try to reinitiate that. He's going to try to use American ships and sailors to um, trade and use that sugar uh, to profit. So that's going to break the British rule of uh, 1753 or 63, whatever it ends up being. Uh, and that's going to cause the British to uh, turn their attention to American ships. So 1756 okay. is what the rule is. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, good. We got our correction. 1756, not 53. So, um, with that rule in place, again, the French re-engage the uh, re-engage sugar trade, or at least transportation, with the U.S. And again, that's in violation of the rule because it's it's at a time of war now. So now Britain is going to enforce their rule of 1756 on the Americans. They're saying, all right, since you're engaging in sugar trade with the French, we're going to start taking your ships and your sailors. That's exactly what they start doing. So you have the British begin taking American ships and sailors. And in retaliation, because the British are enjoying the benefits of this, the French do the same thing. The French also, on a, on a much smaller scale, um, start also taking advantage of the very vulnerable French mer or sorry, American merchant ships. And do, uh, do we have the army or navy to really fight against this? No, no. no we don't. <clears throat> so Jefferson's really only course of action here is in 1807, he decides, you know, after this 1803 re-engagement of war and the British start uh, enforcing their rule of 1756, uh, they're going to uh, begin, Jefferson's going to start the embargo of 1807. And so his idea is, huh, if you're going to take our ships, we're not going to trade with either of you until you start respecting our sovereignty. So he, he only allowed, I think, the, I think technically the, the document said, the United States was not allowed to do business in foreign ports. It was, it was something like that. But there was also a part that said, if the winds carry you to a port, it's okay. So the Americans just basically kept saying, oh, the winds just took us to Europe. Like, we had no choice, and we ended up here and we started trading. Uh, so this embargo did essentially nothing. Uh, the British and French kept receiving American ships because they kept saying they were taken by the winds uh, over across the Atlantic. And then, of course, when they're there, the uh, uh, British and French started just seizing the ships and the goods when they arrived. Like Napoleon even joked, I'm just enforcing your embargo by punishing your sailors that are um, you know, going against your own um, laws. It's, it's kind of hilarious. But anyways, this turns out to be a total disaster. So it is a failure for Jefferson and the uh, uh, Democratic Republicans. And again, the idea here was they were going to try not to trade with Britain or France by making it illegal to go to their ports, uh, but they just pretty much ignore it. American sailors did it anyway, and the British and French continue to take um, sailors and ships. So the Americans lose a lot of money. This embargo is just totally disastrous for the United States. You have economic downturn, and they're forced to reshift their focus of the economy. So no longer can they really focus on, um, in the south here, selling cotton and goods like tobacco to the Europeans. They're forced to sell them domestically and use them here in the United States. So this actually promotes, accidentally, what we call independence, interdependence between the regions. So since I can't sell cotton as easily, to Britain or France or whoever now, I can sell them to other parts of the United States. So a lot of these southern plantations began selling their cotton up north to New England. New England at the same time has slowly been developing their textile industry. And again, textiles are just woven goods, could be clothes or linens, whatever. They're getting factory systems and machines from the British, and they're starting their own textile mills up here in New England. So what we have here, because they can't really trade with anybody else, you have a sort of economic union between the agricultural south, mostly cotton production, and the industrial, or at least industrial leaning north. So we have uh, inadvertently economic interdependence between north and south. And again, the south producing cotton, and the North textile factories. 
In fact, I think the statistic is something like from 1817, I realize this is after, but it, it starts the trend in 1807. From 1870 to 1840, I think New England textiles increase by a thousand percent. So about ten times the production of textiles. Um, so they've really networked uh, an American sort of interdependence between the two regions. So that's the impact here of the disastrous economic and diplomatic policies of Jefferson and the uh, Democratic Republicans, but it does actually sort of start developing and fostering um, manufacturing up here in the north and doubling down on agriculture in the south. So any dependence there was on slaves before is now increasing in the south. And it's increasing too because they're trying to send slaves to these new territories that are being made. We'll talk more about that um, next time when we talk about sectionalism. But also promotes industry in the Northeast because there's not really any agriculture that they can use in the Northeast that's highly profitable. Winters are off limits, like it's too cold in the Northeast, as anyone who's lived up there can tell you. Um, and then uh, they're forced to essentially find other ways of making money year round. What they would do, of course, was like weave things and make things at home, crafts to try to sell them, or using clovers and turnips. But now the North has a consistent year round source of of income and production. And of course, not only do Americans want to buy it, but later other Europeans want to buy it for cheap as well. So it accidentally spurs northern industry and doubles down economic dependence on slaves in the south. You guys understand how that interdependence develops? Excellent. I think we can move on to the next topic, which is the two new parties, and then courts, and then we're done. All right. What? Um, under rule of 1756, it says France what reconquer sugar trade? Reestablish sugar trade with the United States. All right, second party system. So the Federalists fade out of popularity. Um, the Democratic Republicans, especially after this debacle, certainly start fading out of popularity. Um, and we'll talk more about the War of 1812 next time um, when we pick up uh, in a couple weeks. But the uh, new parties that are going to start forming are first the National Republicans and Democratic Party, but then the National Republicans, not really having a cohesive set of views, sort of start turning and developing to what's called the Whig Party, which we'll, we'll talk about here. So, beginning of new parties, the second party system. <clears throat> Alright, so, uh, led by mostly a guy named Andrew Jackson, the fiercely anti-native uh, Democratic Party still held a lot of those agricultural, independent, anti-bank attitudes of Democratic Republicans, uh, but they definitely have a new, more pro, I guess you would say, militaristic view. Because remember, the Democratic Republicans wanted like low taxes, low spending. Democrats were cool with that. They saw the problems in letting your, you know, military go to waste, so they wanted to maintain that, and they had a very, like I said, obstacle oriented view of natives. So they were they had no problem swindling or removing them by force. So the Democratic uh, Party. Again, a lot of it's gonna be led by Andrew Jackson later. This is more the 1820s and 30s. And again, a lot of their their MO is their MO is gonna be um, uh, I don't I don't want to say they're pro war, but they're they're in support of maintaining a, a strong military presence. I would say pro-military, at least not letting it run to waste like the Democratic Republicans did. They're pro-military, they're more anti-commerce, like they don't care as much about international trade, and they're definitely anti-bank. In fact, Jackson, unlike Jefferson, is gonna be the one that officially vetoes and KOs the second national bank in the United States, which also causes an economic collapse and panic in 1837, but you know, whatever. So, pro-military, anti-commerce, anti-bank, and they're uh, pretty anti-Indian uh, insofar as they would much rather clear them out by force. All right. So, the people that start forming the opposing views to this, right, because as this gets more part, uh, popular and gets more uh, power and they get a few presidential candidates and a lot of congressmen, they start making changes, this upsets and unifies any opposing party. So, initially, we have what was known as the National Republicans. This is not the final version of it, by the way. Uh, they were very much like the um, Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans. 
but they were very much in support of commerce, industrialization, and the uh, bank. All right. So again, they're pro-bank, pro-industry, and pro-bank. Oh, I said that pro-bank. Right. Pro-commerce. My bad. All right. Those were kind of their unifying views, but. What's really going to form this into the actual party that defines the second party system, the Whig party, is they're extremely against the hardline attitude of Andrew Jackson and their anti-Indian stance. So while this isn't enough to support sort of like win its own delegates and presidential candidates, when this party rises to prominence, gets a bunch of congressmen, gets a president under Andrew Jackson, who tries to use the presidency to his advantage like um, I don't want to say bribing, but using what we call the spoils system, when you sort of reward people for aligning with you uh, politically by giving them federal job positions. Uh, they see what he does and his personality and how he sort of runs things almost like a monarch. He's not a monarch. He's, he's a democratic guy. Don't get me wrong. In fact, the Democrats also want to expand suffrage. I should actually put that. <clears throat> Right, they want more non-property owning males to be able to vote, essentially. Um, so they're not anti-democratic, but they were very much like a cult of personality behind Jackson. So the National Republicans aren't really solid enough to field a real candidate, but the opposition to Jackson and his sort of dominant personality, their anti-Indian policies, uh, their anti-commerce and bank policies, sort of gets a bunch of people that did not work together before and aligns them in what we call the uh, Whig Party. They actually borrowed that name from England because the Whigs are very much opposed to uh, monarchs and hereditary privilege. And the reason why I mention that is they very much thought that Andrew Jackson was kind of a, at least by popularity, a type of monarch who just did his own thing and kind of ran things the way he wanted to with the spoil system and, and his attitude and policies towards the Americans. So what, what, what really, I guess, to unify these people is they have these same views, right? They're pro-bank, pro-industry, uh, pro-commerce. They very much like this economic independ independence. So they're all, say they're pro-industry, commercialization, bank, and interdependence. So that's borrowing, of course from uh, National Republicans. Oops, interdependence. But what really unified them is they are um, morally opposed to the Democrats and their treatment of Native Americans, as well as uh, their sort of almost cult-like following of Andrew Jackson. So morally against Jacksonians and um, native treatment. Also, the Whigs are big on eliminating alcohol. Now, they don't like, you know, enact prohibition like the progressives do later, but they're very much inspired by Protestant morals, and they're, um, that's going to result in what we call the early temperance movement, which is sort of movements against alcohol. And I mentioned it before, whiskey was very popular, very cheap. Um, so regardless of your social class or location, heavy drinking was common in the United States. They saw that as immoral, right? They wanted to uphold their Protestant Christian morals. And this is inspired too, uh, we don't talk about this a lot in A-Push, it's not really in any of the key concepts I've looked. Um, this is largely due because of the great, second Great Awakening, which is like a second resurgence of inner Protestant uh, belief and connection with, with God and, 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 and the Bible. Second Great Awakening. It's like the 1820s. We do actually talk a little bit about this later when we talk about the breakout of new sects of Christianity like the Shakers and the Mormons and the Utilitarians, but uh, we haven't talked about that yet. So just know that's sort of what defines the two parties. Um, and this, again, is our second party system. Both parties, of course, in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, uh, field multiple presidential and congressional um, uh, representatives, and um, they're going to split and break. This is actually going to hold uh, because of slavery in the South and agriculture. This one's going to split, though, um, when the issue of slavery becomes so polarizing later in the 1840s and 1850s and 60s. Uh, but for now, from roughly 
the 1810s and 20s to the mid 19th century, we have this second party system form of the Democrats and the Whigs. And these are the issues that divide them and define them. So we kind of understand the two different parties. Yes. All right, some uh, important Whigs, of course, are guys like Henry Clay, who was a national Republican and later a Whig. Um, but yeah, so those are, those are the two general movements. All right, Whig Party's not going to last that long. Democratic Party, obviously, is still going. OK. Yeah, the next party system, the third one, is going to be the Republicans, which start out as a very anti-slavery abolitionist movement. And the Democrats, of course, stick with their very pro-slavery. They want to maintain it. <clears throat> All right. So lastly, we'll talk about the uh, judicial branch and their views on federal versus state power. Federal court decisions in favor of federal government. Like I mentioned from period three, uh, most decisions are going to go in favor of the federal government when there's an issue between the federal and state government as far as like who has the authority and whatnot. So there's three cases we want to talk about here. Um, the first is in I think 1803, it is the Marbury versus Madison case. This was an example of where John Adams, when he was in the last hours of his presidency, tried to spite, in 1800, Jefferson, who was taking over, like they were totally ideologically opposite. So Adams was doing his best to appoint government officials and federal judges that had pro-federalist views. Because remember, Adams was a federalist, and um, Jefferson was a Democrat Republican. So at the last minute, he's trying to assign all these federalist postings so that Jefferson can't put in pro-Democratic Republicans. And since, I guess, some of these letters didn't get out in time, like they were written by Adams in time, but some were delivered late, Jefferson tried to tell his Secretary of State, uh, James Madison, not to deliver them, right? Because, oh, it's the time's passed, they didn't get in time, too bad, I get to pick the judge now, or whoever. So, one of the judges who got stiffed um, by Madison not, not getting the letter in time and, and having Jefferson withhold it, uh, he sued, essentially, uh, and went straight to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decided not only that um, did Jefferson have to uphold that appointment, but also the Supreme Court, led by uh, John Marshall, by the way, who was a Federalist, appointed by, I believe, Washington, <clears throat> decided that uh, the Supreme Court had the authority, had authority to judicially review, meaning decide if something is constitutional or not, acts of Congress and the President. So in this case, they overrode a decision by Thomas Jefferson to not deliver that late letter to uh, Marbury. And again, that set the precedent of judicial review. I'll actually make the term itself is judicial review, not judicially review, but in the context of that sentence, they're judicially review. But again, judicial review means the Supreme Court can take any action by Congress or the President and weigh it against the Constitution to see if it's constitutional or not. And if they say it isn't, it's out, it's nullified, right? It's declared unconstitutional. That's a big, a major Supreme Court case. You guys got that one? I'm sure you talked that one to death before. In a push. <clears throat> All right, secondly, we've got McCulloch versus Maryland. This one, the details aren't as important on. This one was basically a, uh, an issue between a state and federal institution. I believe it was, it was banks in this case, or these bank notes. And the question was, can a federal institution operate against the laws and policies of a state? So it's like, okay, here's the state, and then, of course, Maryland in this case. Can uh, federal institutions or, or, or programs that are operating in that state, can they run counter to the actual state's policy? So, again, that's kind of a complicated explanation. If I'm a state, and I've got a certain law that says, I don't know, let's say you can't issue banknotes. That's not the case here, but no banknotes. 
in uh, Maryland. Can't do it, right, according to their law. But I stick a federal bank in there. Can that federal bank exist? Because the state law says you can't do it. This is where it was basically decided that, yes, a federal institution can operate in a state, even if it's against some of the state's local laws. <clears throat> federal institutions, programs, operate in states despite state authority or law. It's basically saying the federal government is the highest authority. And them carrying out their objectives <clears throat> supersedes individual state issues and laws. All right, that's in 1819. Got McCullough versus Maryland? All right, last one. This one's about actually how the Supreme Court enhances transportation in early America, uh, be it uh, railroads or steamboats or roads. So, in the case of Gibbons versus Ogden, I forget the year on that bad boy. Is it, is it the 1820s? Don't quote me. Yep, 1824. <clears throat> this is one where they rule that the federal government has the final say on interstate commerce. It also ruled against state monopolies. Basically what happened was there was a <clears throat> company, I can't remember which state, was it New York or New Jersey? There was a company named the Hudson River uh, a Company and it had a monopoly on ferrying people over. So they, they were, the state was not allowing other um, companies of other states to operate there because they said their company had a monopoly. And again, the whole point there is if all the money is going to this company, the tax money goes to that state. So they're trying to support or keep a monopoly on a company between states. So it's not just in their state. They're saying all state businesses uh, cannot operate. Only this one can, right, because they want, of course, that state tax income. However... Uh, this court ruling is going to determine that the federal government has the final say in all interstate commerce. So when it's companies or people engaging in business between states, such as that ferry business, <clears throat> states cannot grant monopolies. Like you have to allow the, the companies to operate uh, federally between states. You can't just say, oh, this, you know, this, this, this company can't operate here uh, because we already have a company for that. You have to allow the other company to operate there. So in doing that, that allowed a whole bunch of other ferrying businesses to open up to compete, which of course provided more transportation opportunities for the people, invited competition to increase the quality of the ferry businesses in the times, reduce the price, right, because they're competing. And this act against state monopolies and uh, establishing the authority of the federal government regarding uh, interstate commerce actually going to vastly expand uh, road systems, because most of these are built by private companies. Road systems, um, canals, canal building, and railroads. So that decision alone and others supporting it are going to uh, greatly increase the availability of land and contracts to companies that are going to vastly expand our transportation network, especially in the north. And that's going to, like the Erie Canal, for example, which we'll talk about connecting the Great Lakes to New York. Um, the Hudson River. Um, later on, all the railroad networks in the Northeast, the Transcontinental Railroad, all the roads running between states, they're going to expand massively because they're not limited by state monopolies now. Right? Because the federal government has the final say and allows companies to operate between states. Uh, states can't determine which companies can and can't operate there. The court cases. And we'll pick up from continuing on the Whig Party formation. So. Uh, there was a split in the early um, early 19th century over economic issues. Uh, we had some people that preferred Henry Clay's American system, which was more like a, a commerce, industrial-based system and banking uh, and finances, whereas we had a lot of people that still really wanted to go the agriculture route with the individual independent farmer. Um, so they, they started to split over the National Republican Party, but the thing that's really going to drive a whole second party is the morality of what's going to become the Whig Party. 
So they were big on uh, morals. So the formation of the Whigs. This is also the uh, what characterizes the second party system, which I think I mentioned before, but just do it again. Um, so they're driven, of course, by this American system idea of commerce and industry uh, and banking. But also, uh, they have a strong moral, um, I guess you would say, drive as well, uh, some morality driven. So some things that they detested among the Democrats, like Andrew Jackson, are going to be um, their anti-Indian... Uh, well, I should say anti-negative Indian treatment. They did not like the way that Andrew Jackson and the Democrats sort of removed the Native Americans like they were an environmental obstacle. They still saw them as people and should be treated as such. They preferred that Native Americans be assimilated, not treated like a, like I said, an environmental obstacle. So they wanted to, of course, and they're going to employ a lot of Americanization, or at least the people that are part of that party and going forward are going to push Americanization, uh, which is assimilation into American culture. So rather than just remove Indians and put them away and treat them like an obstacle, they would rather uh, teach them how to, you know, manage property, settle down, engage in commerce, agriculture, learn American ideals, uh, those sorts of things. They were also a big part of what would be the temperance movement. Did we talk about that already? We did talk about that already in here? Okay, well, just to recap, uh, they were big on the temperance movement, which because they thought alcohol was like sort of an evil that dr drove, you know, males to be more violent and uh, wasted wages and things like that. <clears throat> they were also big on the um, Sunday school movement going forward. That's a little bit later um, in the 19th century, but it did see its beginnings in the early 19th century. Uh, so temperance and the Sunday school movement, which was literally school on Sundays for kids, uh, rural and urban kids that were not able to get an education uh, because their parents couldn't afford it or they had to work on the farms or whatever. Um, so the Sunday school movement, again, which is a bunch of mostly middle class women, which would take um, kids on their days off on Sunday and, and teach them how to read or do math and things like that. Uh, but we also had a big movement uh, to provide any sort of aid we could. We're going to see these later in the century, the progressive movement <clears throat> in the late 19th, early 20th century, and these things are all really going to take off, uh, as well as private charities, but that's more of a period six topic. Um, but yeah, morality was a big driver uh, for the <clears throat> Whig Party, and they did not like the Democrats' sort of attitude towards natives, and they were much more, I guess you would say, helpful. Uh, part of what drove this, actually, is a thing that you might remember from earlier in the year, in a push is the uh, Second Great Awakening. Does that ring any bells? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> We're not gonna go too in depth on it. Uh, it's basically a 1790s-ish to 1840s-ish movement. And one of the key focuses here is uh, people's inner spirituality. or even their truth. And there was, this, there was this desire to form this connection with God and sort of like restart. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of movements that try to see society as a restart uh, or a reset. It's known as millenarianism. Like the idea that, the idea that uh, Jesus has come again or will come again and we need to reset society to be more towards a perfect or Christian model. And again, that is known as millenarianism. It's very emotional based, um, and we're going to talk right after this too about a uh, a parallel movement in the arts and philosophy known as Romanticism, and they're very um, they're very similar as far as how they're driven. So they're much more emotionally driven, passion driven, and all about this sort of um, moral um, restart and reset to the soul in society. So I trust you guys talked about the Shakers and Mormons and Unitarians. Okay, cool. So that'll be some good review. So a couple new denominations that really take off, especially in the West as people are settling, are the Baptists and Methodists. Those had a lot of emotional appeal. They're a lot less what we call liturgical. Liturgical being like more tradition-based and like, you know, sit up, sit down, listen to the speaker, you know, be quiet. 
um, sing your hymns, etc. These are a little bit more of a personal connection and enthusiasm. Uh, so these are going to be very popular, especially Methodists, popular in West. Those who are settling West, uh, it becomes quite popular. We're also going to have a movement that is opposed, but I'll actually talk about them after. Uh, what we can talk about, though, are the Shakers. There's several founding ish members. One of them is uh, a girl named uh, uh, Martha, Mother Ann Lee. And this is going to be an interesting movement. It's one offshoot we have. We have the Shakers. And they were given this name because. You guys know why they were given that name? Oh, yeah, because they like had those dance routines. Yeah, it was the dances they had, and then they would like kind of shake. Now, that's the way people describe them anyway. Nobody really danced like that back then. Like I said, it was a lot more liturgical and you know tradition driven, etc. So they, they thought it was really odd when these people would have these sort of uh, I guess you'd say moments where they where they would like gripped by the spirit or whatever and would dance and connect with them. So uh, Shakers, Mother Ann Lee's one of the founders. And one of the more odd things that this group believed in was they were opposed to uh, intercourse completely. Uh, so they were celibate. So it's, it's not really a, a movement that encourages its uh, progression into other humans because they pretty much end reproduction almost anyway. Uh, they segregate men and women for the most part. So you would pretty much be in and around other women if you're a woman uh, or men if you're a man. And uh, again, they preached celibacy. So completely... Uh, devoid of any intercourse whatsoever. So celibate. Um, and also, they were, there's one other thing I wanted to talk about. No, that was it. It was just pretty much the dancing that was, they were much more known for. Uh, this is more of a New England movement, uh, but again, it it's going to be sort of just a spark in the 19th century. It's not a movement that really, you know, continues on, especially since they're not really continuing much reproduction with the whole celibacy thing. <clears throat> but anyways, it was a popular movement at the time, and one of its key tenets were segregation of the sexes and celibacy itself. All right. The one that is still around and is still rather popular is uh, Mormonism, the Mormon uh, movement. So Mormonism was a, a very interesting, very millenarianist um, belief, set of beliefs. Um, started by a guy named Joseph Smith. And he believed some interesting things. Uh, he believed that Jesus had already come again the second time. He'd come to the, to the new world uh, earlier. So he believed that some Jews had somehow crossed the Atlantic and settled in the Americas, and there was already a second coming of Jesus. And those that were like uh, somehow sinful or left behind, they were tainted and given um, a darker pigment of skin. And that's who he believed were the Native Americans, uh, who had also forgotten their history and all this other stuff. And of course he was told this, um, much like Muhammad was at Islam, like on his own, isolated in nature, and had an angel come down to him and tell him, tell him these things. And he wrote down um, what the angel told him in what is now the Book of Mormon, and which is where they get their uh, Book of Mormon beliefs from. Uh, not a lot of people really liked this. It was not, it tried to be recognized as another branch of Christianity, but most Christians did and do reject this because it completely goes against what Christians go off of, which is the Bible. It rejects basically the scripture and adds much about the stuff. So, um, yeah, Christians had a hard time dealing with that um, going forward, and so Mormons were persecuted. Obviously, they're still here today. There's some at this school and in this room, uh, but it, it was not a movement that had a good friendly start. Um, there's a fair amount of prejudice they had to deal with. Um, so in the East, um, they were discriminated against. So John, or not John Smith, Joseph Smith tried to move uh, to Illinois, which at the time was more or less the frontier in the early 19th century. There weren't a whole lot of uh, people settling there, uh, but they had a lot of issues there as well. Like they tried to get tax exempt status. They tried to get recognized as religion. Um, but ultimately, uh, Joseph Smith was um, hanged for uh, treason. They mostly didn't like the fact that Mormons rejected the uh, Christian scriptures, and uh, there was rumors that they practiced polygamy, which is another thing Christians are very much opposed to. So Mormons were not well accepted in the early 19th century in a mostly Protestant America, and uh, they had to move further west, actually. So they followed a guy named Brigham Young, 
to present day. You guys know? Yeah. Utah, yep. They followed him to Utah, settled there in Salt Lake City. I believe, I'm not 100% sure on this, I, I believe they tried to start their own state, um, but, I, but it, I'm not sure the specifics of it, but obviously they were later incorporated as a uh, state of the United States, not their own country or polity. Uh, but that is why there are so many um, Mormon universities and Mormon majorities in the Midwest is because they had to move out there in the early 19th century because they were being persecuted uh, where most of the Protestants and Easterners were. So you've got um, universities and cities that have Mormon majorities in like Utah, um, some in Wyoming, some in Colorado, some in Idaho, uh, more of those Western settlements at the time in the early to mid 19th century. All right, so not a good chapter in American history as far as being accepting and religiously tolerant, but nonetheless, the movement still carries on. Also what carried on to a lesser degree because these four were all very emotionally driven and connection, you know, personal connection with God driven. They were not like very, like what you would call rational or liturgical. Um, they weren't very enlightened. So there was kind of a counter movement to these as well. So again, if these four are very passionately, emotionally driven, um, a counter movement to that would be the Unitarians of the Northeast, like the New England region. Uh, these were inspired by Enlightenment rationalism, and they also were unpopular for the same reason the Mormons were unpopular, because they rejected the uh, Bible and scriptures. So they believed that Jesus was not like the actual son of God, like a divine being. They just believed he was a really good uh, moral example. Uh, so again, it's more of, these guys are known as, and, and these did, this wasn't so popular, it exploded into this major denomination, but they do still continue today in sparse numbers. Um, so it's Enlightenment Rationalism, it's a reaction to the uh, Second uh, Great Awakening. And they actually rejected Jesus' divinity. But again, they believed he was real and they believed that uh, he was an excellent moral example that should be followed, essentially. So that's more or less what the Unitarians were. And that's about it for, just to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Nope, the only thing I forgot to mention was um, Brigham Young moved them out to uh, Utah in 1844, because that's when I think Joseph Smith was um, actually hanged or killed. So, any questions about the Second Great Awakening or the Whigs? For like Mormonism, is it kind of just like a separate example of like religion spurring from the Second Great Awakening? Yeah, it's a millenarius movement. Like they believed that there was a restart to society and that like that had already happened. And this was the second society, the second coming, or it had already happened. So they, they wanted to live as such in, with those new rules. They believed sort of that the Bible didn't apply anymore. That's why they had this new set of beliefs with the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why most Christians rejected it. And they, again, at the time they were discriminated against along with the Unitarians. But the Mormons definitely got the, the harsh end of the stick on that. Um, so yeah, again, they had to move several times. Their leader was killed. Uh, but they eventually you know, were able to settle down peacefully in the Midwest where there weren't very many people. <clears throat> All right, they're still going today, though. Millions of people across the United States. There's plenty here in California. Um, I mean, I'm from Oakdale. There was a large Mormon population there. And we got some at this school, too. So they're still around. All right, and again, hey, that's part of American ideals, man. You, uh, the acceptance of religious toleration. You don't have to believe everything everyone believes, but you should at least let, they should be allowed to exist and operate, obviously. Okay, so, Romanticism. Uh, this is kind of a parallel movement with uh, the Second Great Awakening. Uh, you could, I mean, one could even argue that the Great Awakening was a res Second Great Awakening was a response to this philosophical, uh, artistic, romantic movement. And this is much like Unitarians were a response to the Second Great Awakening. Romanticism was a emotion and passion based response to the Enlightenment, which was super rational and, and rigid and logic based. You know, half half ish of people prefer that, and half ish of people prefer the romantic, um, emotional, passionate. 
approach. And what, by the way, when we say romanticism, we don't mean like, oh, look, everyone's falling in love. Like, no, love is an emotion and a, a passion, but it's the whole spectrum of passion and emotion. That can include anger, um, that can include sorrow. Like, it's the whole spectrum of human emotion. So when we say romantic, it means several things. It can mean love, it can just mean passion, or it can mean like um, the romantic languages like based from Roman Latin. So it's all over the place. So just to be clear, we don't just mean it's all about love here. It's about the spectrum of human emotions and passion. All right, so the romantic movement was, a, was huge in Europe at the time. Um, it's gonna coincide with nationalism in Europe and how people started forming nation states and identifying based on you know common language, uh, common culture and race. But in the United States, we can't really have that because there's just too much of a mix. There's Irish people, Italians, Germans, English, Native Americans, uh, black Africans. There's, there's just way too many for people to really form this sort of identity. Um, so Americans sort of go their own route on romanticism. It's a little bit different than the movement from Europe. Um, we're gonna go more so the, there's gonna be a sense of nationalism. I guess I shouldn't say entirely it wasn't. There was definitely a sense of nationalism, like identifying as an American, appreciating American ideals, American culture, American land. Uh, we had a, a large movement in art, known as the Hudson River uh, School, where I think I mentioned this before, because this is where they really take off, where they would go around and uh, paint American landscapes, you know, very detailed landscapes. First, of course, in the Hudson River area, and then like the Appalachian Mountains. And as we expanded further west, they would you know, include the Rockies, uh, the Grand Canyon. It was all stuff that was seen as American and appreciated for its beauty, as nature was just as much a part of uh, the romantic movement as were human emotions and passion. So art, um, very much focused around the grandeur of American, I guess you'd say landscapes and nature. Uh, but also there was a move uh, known as transcendentalism here. And this is a movement that is inspired by a few things. So it's very, it's very romantic in nature because it believed that each person sort of had like an inner self or inner truth uh, or even an inner beauty. And the whole point of this was to tap into this inner truth and this innate goodness that all people have uh, and work to making a society built around that. So again, all about an inner truth. And again, this is very romanticism based, very emotion and passion based. People are generally good and they should live their lives according to what they feel uh, is right and good. All right, so inner truth, inner goodness, or innately good, naturally good. And they also started to believe that what they made, created, and thought was good here in the United States. Because in the early 19th century, pretty much all novels and books and knowledge was like imported from Europe. But we're gonna see here with the rise of romanticism and nationalism and this sort of transcendentalist movement that believe that you know, we have our own inner truth and um, goodness, that we should really appreciate American culture and ideas. So here, we have a, a, a big movement where we go from having, I think, like 75% or something like that, 75% of all books and knowledge imported from Europe in the early 19th century. By like 1840 or 1850, um, it's down to like, 30% or something like that. So we have a massive, uh, a massive movement where people start trying to create and buy works that were written by and thought of by actual Americans rather than Europeans. Um, one example of that is a guy named uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. I forget the name of the thing. The American scholar as he wrote. Ralph Waldo Emerson. The American scholar. He wrote a work called The American Scholar which emphasized just what I uh, described there, that we Americans uh, have our own good ideas, we have our own set of circumstances and beliefs. And again, we, we saw a shift of, you know, from like roughly 1800 to 1850, we went from going from mostly European works and novels and books to mostly American works and novels and books and ideas. Uh, so that was a, a fundamental movement in early American history. Um, and lastly, the, the AP uh, test wants us to know about architecture. I think I mentioned this in the last one. There's not a whole lot on American architecture. Um, we're really well known for our use of steel to make like skyscrapers and grand bridges and things like that. That's more late 19th century, but 
One thing we still were doing at the time, as part of uh, embracing our nationalist identity, was sort of reaching back into Western culture, like the old democratic foundations of the ancient Greeks and even Roman Republic. So we have a lot of our, of course, state buildings made uh, with marble, marble pillars, Roman arches, things like that. References to classical antiquity uh, and things like that. So I would say architecture, antiquity, early antiquity anyway. Early antiquity just means like ancient Greeks, Roman Republic. Any questions about that? I'll let you finish writing for a second. I'll grab a drink. Oh, Gatorade. <clears throat> All right. So, economics. You guys know I hate talking about economics. Mm -hmm. So, one thing that's really beginning to catch on in the early 19th century is well, you tell me, what's, what's, what sort of economic ideas are starting to catch on, be applied? Capitalism. Capitalism, yes. So, <clears throat> the fundamentals of capitalism are being applied to the American economy slowly. Not, not quickly, though, right? Because we still have a huge uh, division, right? The Whigs are definitely pushing capitalist ideals, which we'll talk about here in a second, briefly. Um, but... We have a huge movement, though, on the more Democratic side, or the old, old Republican, Democratic Republican side, like Jeffersonians, that are still emphasizing agriculture and independent farmers. So it's not like we jump into industry in the early 20th century. There's still a fair amount of resistance from uh, individual and small farmers going all the way through the 19th century. Like the last big, I guess you say, movement that's based on rural farmers was like the populist movement at the, um, in the 1890s or so. So there's still a fair amount of resistance to this, but it is starting. So, fundamentals of capitalism. Just a quick review. Adam Smith wrote about these. He didn't necessarily invent capitalism, but he certainly articulated the uh, fundamentals of it and codified the beliefs. Uh, Adam Smith, in his book, The Wealth of Nations, yep, you guys remember that. I mean, we talked about that in the world, and then Euro, and, and now again. <clears throat> Wealth of Nations, 1776. But the fundamentals are being applied. So, some of the fundamentals. Who sets the prices? The businesses. Right, the market does. So the buyers and sellers. I respond to you guys. Like, if I'm the business, I'm the supplier, and you guys are the demand, the consumers, I'm going to respond to you. Like, if I'm selling this marker for, for $200, no one's going to buy that, unless it was, like, George Washington's marker or something like that. If it's just a regular marker, no one's going to pay that. So I can't charge that or I'll go out of business. But if I charge one cent and you all buy it, and it costs me 25 cents to make it, I'm also going to go out of business. So I have to find what you're willing to pay, but I also am getting a profit off it. So if I'm selling it for 75 cents, and you're all buying it at a good and a reasonable, um, I guess you'd say, rate, then I'm making a profit, you guys are getting what you want, and we've sort of found that equilibrium price, right? It used to be set by governments and guilds. If you guys remember from uh, AP Euro and AP World, those were rigidly set by, you know, basically a cartel or a small group that controlled the prices uh, and that did not allow for a lot of economic growth. There weren't really guilds in the United States, uh, but they are going to really try to harness that sort of market pricing. Uh, they, they also want to avoid tariffs, right? That's not going to be very popular early on because the United States does not compete well with the European goods. So if we try to make goods here in America, manufactured goods, the British were the ones that kicked off the Industrial Revolution, so they make stuff way cheaper than us. So, how did politicians try to make sure you bought American stuff? How could they do that? The British have it cheaper, and you're here in the United States, and they want you to buy American goods. What could they do? Politicians. Yeah. Put tariffs on it, right? So, this is definitely not capitalist, because Adam Smith was a proponent of free trade. And we're going to get there eventually. But early on, the competition from Europe is too stiff, so... At the time, these Whigs are pushing uh, protections, and they want tariffs so that we buy our own stuff and protect our own industry. Uh, but, the, but we should know that we should not confuse that with fundamentals of capitalism. Uh, so free trade's a fundamental, right? Because what Adam Smith and most free trade or free market uh, thinkers believe is that if all states have no tariffs, 
then sure, some of your industries will fail. But the ones you do better than other countries, because there's only a certain amount of labor you have, like not everyone can do everything. The stuff you're really good at making will put the other uh, countries out of business in that, in that industry. So you'll provide, like, let's say the United States makes, um, at the time, they make shovels super well. Like, we got coal right there, we've got um, iron right there in the Appalachians, we've got plenty of timber, we can make shovels super cheap. Way better than France or Britain can. So if we focus on the shovel industry, are we going to put British and French shovel makers out of business? Yes. Yes, we are. So we shift most of our production to shovels, they go out of business, but hey, guess what? The British make textiles way better than us. So if I go out of business in the shovel making industry, what might I be able to go into in Britain? The textile, the textile industry, right? And let's say the French are really good at making cheese. So they make their cheese really well, then people go out of, out of business in the textile industry or the shovel making industry, they focus on making cheese, and then boom, there we go. We've got three countries, <clears throat> Trading, buying, and selling with each other uh, with the cheapest possible goods, which of course means you can buy more stuff, which means you have more real money. All those benefits apply. So they believe in free trade, which means again, no tariffs or guilds. Important distinction though, again, we aren't quite there yet. Americans are still very hesitant to engage in free trade because they don't want their whole industry to just drop and their economy to crash. All right. Um, what keeps my prices? low and my quality high though because like i mean if there's no guild telling me that i have to make a certain quality or set a certain price what guarantees or hopefully guarantees that i am setting prices that are not too high or too low but also that my quality isn't terrible competition yeah competition and again these are fundamentals of capitalism i, I emphasize them a lot heavier in the world in euro um, videos because obviously that's part of the curriculum there this is more just an overview of it so, competition, again, if I'm selling this Gatorade here, that's not a product endorsement, by the way, I just happen to have Gatorade. Um, so if, um, if I have this Gatorade here, and I'm selling it at my store for $5, I mean, if I'm the only store here, you kind of have to pay it, right? Unless, I mean, well, now you can just order on Amazon, but let's pretend you couldn't order stuff on catalogs on Amazon. So, you gotta get the $5 Gatorade, but if, uh, you open a, I can't use guys' names because we're filming. If you open a store, you know, next to me and you sell Gatorade for $2, where's everyone going to go? To my store. They're going to your store, right? Because they can buy at least twice as much Gatorade, right? What does that force me to do? Lower. I have to lower my price as well. Otherwise, I'm going to go out of business, right? And if we're makers of drinks, like let's say I have Gatorade and he has Powerade, I don't know. Um, and Powerade's che cheaper, I could try maybe to somehow make mine taste better or work better, right? It's, it's sort of a quality issue. So if my prices are too high and my product isn't as high quality or it's the same, I'm just going to go straight to him. So that forces me to either lower my prices or raise my quality. So competition helps provide that. Okay, here's the other thing people were afraid of. Uh-oh, if society needs medicine, how do we know we're going to have medicine if no one's if the state isn't requiring people to make it, then we'll just not have medicine. We'll be done. That's it. The human race is going to go extinct. What, what ensures that whatever size society needs, be it houses or food or medicine or whatever, how do we know it's going to be available? What provides that? Our own selfish desires. Yes. What was, um, that's roughly speaking what it was. What was Adam Smith's like uh, uh, term for that? Last day fear? No, it yes. What's this? Uh, free hand. Free hand? <laughs> oh, free hand. Like oh my gosh, it's invisible hands. Oh. No. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe Pangbird didn't talk to you guys about that forever. I think he He's not the invisible easy. hand. Oh, okay. Well, I'd be disappointed if you forgot my stuff from a year ago or two years ago and then his stuff. <clears throat> so anyways, invisible hand. Um, that is the idea that we are driven. We have two primary drives, depending on the person. Either we want to help other people or we want to profit or both. And right, this is essentially that belief. If there's a dying need for houses <clears throat> out of the thousands or millions of people, 100% chance that somebody or some set of people are willing to go out and figure out how to acquire the supplies and the finances and provide a house for you. 
because not only do they want to help some people, uh, other people, but also they want to profit, right? So some people are driven by the profit, some people are driven by, by the helping others, but I, I would say most people generally are driven by both. Um, but again, there's definitely exceptions to that. So that's the invisible hand. We don't have to worry about the government saying, we need this, build this, we need this, build this, because people will on their own, because they go, oh look, hella people need this, I should make it to A, help them, and of course B, uh, make a profit, or just profit, or just help them, whatever it might be. All right, <clears throat> and that is, well, that's good enough to understand the fundamentals of capitalism. So this is going to revolutionize the world, at, or at least the Western world, as countries start adopting these policies. It's, it's a slow-moving process. Even though he laid it out well in his book, <clears throat> people aren't just going to like cannonball into this and, you know, make their economies potentially vulnerable. So, the United States, we're going to start going this route. It's just going to be a, a progressive thing, especially this. A lot of Americans are going to fight the free trade idea because, I said, like I said, they want to make sure that their miners and lumberjacks and textile workers and, you know, corn farmers don't just go out of business because they go to free trade and some other company, or sorry, country out competes them. All right. <clears throat> However, we do start transitioning from agriculture to uh, industrial, industry, industry, there we go. Factories and manufacturing. So it's, a, like I said, it's a slow process. It's like a hundred year process of where uh, farmers and rural um, professions are gonna be quite popular and strong throughout most of the 19th century. By the end of the 19th century, <clears throat> They're going to be largely eliminated, at least the small independent farmers. But uh, it's always going to be a force, especially in the early 19th century in the United States. However, what we're focusing on for this uh, discussion is the industry portion. Because what we're going to experience here in the early 19th century is what we call the market revolution. So this is the early 19th century. And this is going to change American life, as well as later European life. Because for the first time in world history, in the early 19th century, people are purchasing goods, manufactured goods, at a higher rate than they are making them themselves. Most people would sort of provide everything themselves. They provide their own housing and clothes and food, etc., by literally making it themselves or with their families or in their communities. Now, however, when we start applying the fundamentals of capitalism, and there's banks and venture capitalists to provide money uh, to start these businesses up, they actually get so good at making things and making them such a low price that it's actually easier for people to go buy, you know, clothes for a day's wage as opposed to spending a week making it, right? So it saves them time and money. So now they have more time to work or make more money or, or spend it on leisure, whatever they want to do. Um, and those prices, as people are competing, right, like this textile um, mill pops up and this one pops up and this one pops up, so they find better ways to make it, lower the price even more. So again, what was a day's wage to pay for a shirt becomes, you know, half a day's wage. So people keep saving more money and more time, which allows them, of course, to buy more things or uh, work more or make things on their own that they can sell for profit. So what we have here is, of course, the purchasing of of manufactured goods as opposed to making. <clears throat> so again, you know, building houses, making clothes, things like that, that takes a long time. And this is where we start transitioning to, okay, now we have businesses and companies that do this well enough and cheap enough that it's actually beneficial for me to work for my own money and pay somebody else to do it or go buy it at a store, right? So this is a shift. And that's what we're used to now. Like, we don't make anything now. Like, I, I'm, I made nothing I use today, right? I use clothes and a car and food and a computer and a chair and a broom. And, I, like, I haven't made a single item that I'm going to use the entire day. Unless you, unless you can't, like, I take my food and I make it into a sandwich. <laughs> like, I didn't make any of the bread or anything that I'm, I'm putting it together with. So, um... We live in a market revolution world. So keep that in mind. This is, the, this is a, a monumental shift in society where, again, we're no longer making our own stuff. We buy stuff for cheap from people who make it really well. All right? And that benefits us all. So we have higher quality things. We can get more of them. And we have more time to either work 
um, or spend it you know leisure with our family or friends or whatever. So that's that's the beginnings of the market revolution. Uh, obviously, they had to work a hell of a lot back then, especially when the wages were so low. But that's the shift in American culture and Western culture in general. All right, so we got that market revolution. <clears throat> One thing I want to note, though, is this is going to actually drive a division in the North and South. So who do you think goes more the industry route? North. The North does. North. And the uh, South goes more the agriculture route. They double down on slavery, right? Especially after the invention of the cotton gin, which we talked about, and I think it was 1793. When it made it way cheaper, cheaper <clears throat> to uh, extract cotton and turn it into uh, uh, thread and then cloth. So the South is going to double down on their agriculture, and of course they're going to double down on needing slaves and protecting their uh, rights to have slaves. And the North is going to, of course, since they're not as good agriculturally, pursue the more manufacture-based route. So they're going to go more commerce, uh, more American system, I slow it up here? Yeah, more American system type deal, forming textile uh, mills and factories and expanding in finances and railroads and things like that. So we have the beginnings of a cultural shift of where the South goes the agricultural route and the North goes the industrial route, right? And that's going to play out um, with major consequences in the Civil War, which we'll start talking about here uh, pretty quickly. <clears throat> Before I talk about that, though, I wanted to first cover uh, cities and immigration, and then we'll cover um, sectionalism, and then we'll take a, take a break before we start period five. So, <clears throat> in the North, especially, I have many, many uh, textile mills, uh, beginnings of railroads, in the 1830s and 1840s, they invent the telegraph, and telegraph companies start setting up um, uh, like uh, what are now telephone lines and power lines, right? So uh, telegraphs, phones. This is more towards the end of period four, uh, in like the 1830s and 1840s, but it begins. And um, with that, in the expansion of cities too, I should put cities. What do all of these things require? Railroads, telephone lines, cities, textile mills, or, or digging up canals, that's another big one. Canals for transportation, with the steamboat being invented later. What's required for all those things? A lot of labor. labor. You need a ton of labor, right. So in the north, I need a ton of labor. And this isn't, we don't need slaves for this. This isn't a slave-based thing. This is a, a business-driven, wage-driven, um, uh, I guess you'd say, demand. So. There's a group of people that, not slaves obviously, they don't get paid. There's a group of people though that are willing to work for extremely low wages. Immigrants. Immigrants, right. They're trying to escape things. Like for example in China you got the Taiping Rebellion where like millions, of, I think they killed 30 million people in like, in like 20 or 30 years. This is before like modern weaponry. Like they're dying from starvation and disease and literally being stabbed to death. So <clears throat> there's a major, major, major rebellion. It's actually part of this millenarius um, movement, by the way. Uh, you guys remember, um, what was his name? Hong Shi Kuang, I think his name is. Uh, he's the one that believed he was like the, the brother of Jesus, and he had come to restart society in southern China, and they fought the Qing dynasty for like almost three decades. 30 million people died, and people just want to get the hell out of there. Like, it destroyed the economy. So we had many, many, many males coming over uh, from China uh, into the United States. We also had, in Europe, we had the potato famine, so people were escaping economic depravity because potatoes were a major part of the economy there, as, as well as people just starving from the potato famine. So a whole bunch of Germans coming over from southern Germany, like more Catholics, uh, because that's the more rural agrarian part of Germany. Ireland, we got a bunch of English, some Eastern Europeaners, some Southern Europeaners, although not as many. Um, we got a whole bunch of immigrants coming over, and they're desperate too. They're fleeing famine, they're fleeing war, they're fleeing um, economic depravity. So they're in a new place, they usually don't speak English, and they're willing to work for almost nothing. So we have to provide labor for this, not only uh, Americans themselves, like American citizens, but very, very desperate immigrants. And they, they, they come over on the boat, they're inspected to make sure they're mentally and physically healthy, or at least enough so. And they're just like let free in the United States. And they don't know the culture, know the language, or anything. And they have nothing. 
So if you have nothing, working for anything is better than nothing. So these guys are desperate to work for almost nothing. So who's not going to like that, by the way? American people. Yes, American citizens, right? Because they want higher wages, right? So if I'm demanding, or if I'm willing to work for like, remember, this is back then, if I'm willing to work for like $5 a day, which is not a terrible amount of money back then, and some immigrant shows up, and they're willing to work for $2, what's going to happen to me? Yeah. I'm either going to work for $2, which is going to suck, or I'm going to get fired, right? So a lot of the, the uh, American citizens do not like these immigrants coming over from uh, Germany, Ireland, and, and again, I'm talking southern Germany here, because southern Germany is just like the United States, is much more agriculturally based, and they're also more Catholic. So I have a lot of Irish and Germans who are Catholic coming over uh, to work in these factories. Later on in the 19th century, we have a lot of Italians and Slavic people and Greeks and things, uh, which are a mix of Catholic and e uh, Eastern Orthodox. But this is going to be a big topic in period five because people are going to be uh, opposed, American citizens are going to be opposed to these Catholic immigrants competing with them for wages because they drive wages down. Again, no employer is going to keep you there for $5 an hour or a day if they can just hire an immigrant for $2 a day. Like, yeah, sure, they'll suck for a couple weeks of living the job, but they're going to be cheaper in the long run by Mr. $5 guy. Either take the pay cut or get the hell out. So uh, immigration is going to be... <clears throat> a major point of contention in the early 19th, or early to mid 19th century uh, in the United States. All right, um, one thing I forgot to mention was in the South, obviously slave labor is gonna be um, the driving force there, but more and more farmers, or I should say plantation owners, are gonna shift from like tobacco or corn or rice or wheat or whatever, and any that could, if they have the environment for it, are going to switch to cotton because cotton is going to be highly lucrative, meaning it's very profitable. Because in the north here, we have a lot of textile mills and factories being formed. So to supply that cotton, the south is going to um, really double down on cotton. In fact, there was a term for that it's called king cotton, was the um, dominance of the cotton industry and the cotton plantations, meaning they expanded so so vastly buying up small farmers or some farmers that went bankrupt, um, expanding their cotton plantations and selling it to the north. And they formed this sort of interdependence where they provided cotton for the uh, north and the north would sell those textiles and of course pay for more cotton from the south. So the two sides sort of grew up uh, together. But again, this is gonna culturally drive them apart because slaves are gonna be the main focus of the south and in the north, it's gonna be about free labor markets, meaning workers who are paid and competing. And they can't compete against slaves, by the way, because slaves aren't paid. Uh, so that's gonna be a point of contention later. You guys got that? All right, so let's talk about sectionalism, which I've already touched on a little bit, and then we'll take a break uh, before we do period five. <clears throat> All right, so sectionalism. Sectionalism is sort of like what we call tribalism now, uh, meaning, based on sections anyway, that if you've got the United States, all right, let's get this crappy United States going here. So you've got the United States. Um, the sections would, of course, be the mostly south and the mostly north. And again, at the time, we haven't really settled much by the mid uh, 19th century. So we've got some states formed here, but these are just sort of undeclared, unestablished, um, at least in period four, territories, right? They haven't been quite settled. In fact, some of these territories, this is like still Mexico for period four. Um, so the, these territories are not settled or made into states yet. So we have a very, a very tribal, rigid dynamic developing culturally with agriculture and slavery in the South and industry and free labor, uh, free wage labor in the North. So again, we've already touched on that cultural difference of industry slash labor uh, versus agriculture and slavery in the South. But they're, they're also in interdependent though, because again, they supply the cotton for these textiles which they sell to each other and other people and kind of goes in a cycle. So that's a cultural divide, <clears throat> but also we've got a divide um, 
just based on the premise of slavery itself. So, first of all, we have some uh, abolitionists that are opposed to slavery on moral grounds. So, obviously, part of the Enlightenment is you believe in natural rights and people being created equal, so slavery is a huge, I guess you would say, stain on Enlightenment ideals, or at least in the United States. Because if we believe all humans are, you know, guaranteed these natural rights of life, liberty, property, or pursuit of happiness, or whatever, and uh, we're all created equal, then having slaves is a little bit of a, it's a little hypocritical, right? So, there's definitely some people that oppose it on moral grounds, morality, right? And they cite just basic enlightenment fundamentals, and even Christian fundamentals. And of course, some, some Christians point to the fact that the Bible condones slavery in some instances, but they also believe that, you know, the individual is sacred, and it's their duty to help others and not uh, oppress them. So some people draw on enlightenment um, uh, ideals. That's obviously the most clear one, because there's not even any... There's not even any confusion with enlightenment ideals. It's like just we're created equal. We have these natural rights. That's it. <clears throat> but some also pull from uh, Christianity. But then some again, some pro-slavery people pull from the uh, Bible as well. All right. Um, so the major issue. Well, I, I'll keep talking about abolitionists actually. So some examples of abolitionists. We have some escaped slaves that are going to be, of course, obviously a pro opposed to uh, uh, slavery. So a guy named Frederick Douglass. He's an escaped slave who escaped up north, uh, educated himself, taught himself to read and write, and started a um, newspaper called the, I believe it's called the North Star. Let me double check. Make sure I got that right. I didn't write it down. I believe it's called the North Star. But I always forget if it's that or the Liberator. I think the Liberator was William Lloyd Garrison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> he started this uh, North Star, this abolitionist uh, periodical. We also have some violent rebellions from abolitionists, uh, black abolitionists like Nat Turner. Um, I believe it was in 1831. He started a rebellion in Virginia, which was of course suppressed by the uh, militia, the Marines, but um, it did sort of spook many uh, Southerners who believe that abolitionists are trying to get rid of slavery in the South. Uh, it's weird, both sides believed in conspiracies against each other. Like the North thought there was a slave conspiracy to spread slavery everywhere, and the South believed there was a North conspiracy to end slavery everywhere uh, when they both just wanted to protect uh, and limit their own interests. All right, so those are both um, uh, examples of abolitionists that took action. Um, one, of course, was an escape, well, these are both escaped slaves, all right? Uh, free blacks that, of course, are abolitionists. Um, Richard Allen, I think is his name, double checking here. Yes, Richard Allen was a minister, a Methodist minister, and uh, he did not like the fact that Methodist churches were segregated. So, in protest of this segregation, segregated congregation, he and all of the uh, black members rose up and walked out and started their own church. Um, so he's one of the founding members of, um, I didn't write the name down, but a, a, a black Methodist church that was, of course, opposed to the segregation of the Congress. Do you remember the name of it? Is it the African American Episcopal Church? I don't know if it was that one. It might be. I forget the name, and I didn't write it down. But yes, uh, he does start his own um, African American church, and that might be the name of it. <clears throat> All right. And... Oh, yeah. David Walker. That was the other guy. Uh, he was a textile uh, shop owner in the North, and he would send of course, textiles down south uh, with um, basically anti-slavery propaganda and notaries in the actual clothes. He would, he would um, sort of smuggle those down in his shipments. So again, uh, these are uh, black abolitionists and former slaves, but there was plenty of, of white abolitionists as well. You had guys like um, William Lloyd Garrison and, and basically any classical liberal is going to be opposed to this. Um, anyone that sort of believes in John Stuart Mill's idea, John Stuart Mill's idea of um, utilitarianism and uh, opening up the vote to all people and having equal opportunity for all people. All right. Um, the issue, though, is going to be about what to do with these new territories, because at the time in period four, with the with the Louisiana Purchase, and uh, uh, in 1819 we got Florida. And uh, in the 1840s, late 1840s, we're going to have a war with Mexico. We're going to annex Texas, uh, win this territory from Mexico, uh, sign a treaty with Britain and Oregon. And we're basically going to form 
what is now the continental United States uh, by the late 1840s. And the question is, like, what the hell do we do with these, with these new territories? Like, how do we carve them into states? Should they have slaves? Should they not have slaves? Uh, that became a major issue. Because at the time, in like 1820, for example, uh, there were 11 slave states and 11 free states. So the South really liked this tie because they could protect their, uh, their I guess you'd say, policy of slavery. They feared the uh, North was trying to get rid of it, and they believed, correctly so, that if they've got half of Congress, that they'll be able to protect it. Like, they won't be able to pass amendments unless, and they just won't be able to. Because the only two ways to pass amendments are either Congress, and they could stop it by having half, because you need two-thirds, and two-thirds of state legislatures, but again, if 11 states are a slave, then they're not, that's not going to happen. So they wanted to maintain at least an even amount of slave and free states. So to ensure this, uh, in 1820, we had the Missouri Compromise. Because then the question was, what do you do with this? Are they slave? Are they, are they, are they free? Like, how, how, do we, how do we split this? They came up with what was called the Missouri Compromise, where they added Missouri as a slave state, but that was the only exception, because no longer after the Missouri Compromise, and of course they're just going to go against this later in 1854, but uh, the idea was that there could not be any more slave states admitted north of the, I think, 36-30 uh, parallel. So, or latitude, longitude line. So, even though Missouri was the exception to that, uh, these could be admitted as slave territories, but the ones north of that had to be admitted as uh, free states. Maine was thought of as a free state to equal it out. Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't mention that part, but yes, that is also true. Uh, to keep that number even mm -hmm. uh, with the 50-50 with the split. Um, so, with, with Missouri, though, uh, it is going to be, of course, a violation of that, but that's like supposed to be the one exception. Uh, to that rule. Of course, they're going to break that, like I said, again with the Kansas Nebraska Act in 1854. But temporarily, we have sort of a, I guess, calm in the sectionalist tensions between the uh, North and the South. One thing I should mention too, and this is going to be important going forward when we talk about the um, disillusion of the Whig Party when we start period five, is there was, of course, many abolitionists in the North that wanted to get rid of it based on moral grounds, but there were some people that wanted to get rid of um, slavery but they weren't inspired by like bringing equality to blacks or you know morality. There were also people that straight from the north that just didn't want black people in the west. So obviously that's not morally driven. They just don't want blacks to be out there in the western part of the United States. Um, so if they limit slavery to the uh, you know southern states here then of course they can't um, bring uh, African Americans out into the, the free states because they're at the time not seen as citizens. Um, so obviously that's not morally driven, uh, but also not quite as racist, but still not morally driven, is many wanted to uh, <clears throat> protect uh, the wages of workers. Because obviously if you're a free laborer up in the north working for a wage, you can't compete with a slave because slaves work for nothing. So a lot of wage earners in the North did not want slavery to expand because they wanted to make sure that they could continue to uh, um, work in the free labor market and negotiate for wages. So again, these aren't just morally driven, especially not this one, obviously. Uh, nonetheless, these three groups are going to eventually sort of merge together and form what's called the Republican Party uh, that's going to oppose the expansion of slavery. Like these guys are basically known as free soilers who don't want slavery to expand, uh, not for moral reasons, um, but the abolitionists, they're gonna have that common cause of stopping um, slavery. One of the big issues is gonna be the Whigs are spread throughout the North and the South, but on the issues of slavery, like the Kansas-Nebraska Act, it's gonna be a pretty much sectional Southern Whigs for the most part uh, support the act, and the Northern Whigs for the most part uh, oppose the act. So they can't come with the presidential or congressional candidates, and then, of course, they're going to start dissolving. So, that's period four, and we will pick up a period five after the break. Any questions? Sweet, sweet break.